Welcome back, everybody. This Week in America, website thisweekinamerica.us. From popular principal to perceived predator, a former educator relives the perils of wrongful ac- accusations in the book, a thorough factual account of his life story. It's called Standing on Principle. Our guest on the program is Frank Vetro. Frank, welcome to the program. It's great to have you with us. It's my pleasure, Rick. Thanks for having me today. It is an amazing story. You are a principal that's considered to be sort of the future of education, a dream team administrator. Let's go back to where the nightmare began for you. We're looking at February 8th, 2006, Hampton Bays High School. You're a respected principal. You go into work that day and everything is fine. In fact, the first thing you wanted to do, you went in early so you could call your mother and wish her a happy birthday. This was a typical school day for you. Yeah, typical. Got to work early as always and extra early that day because there was a lot going on and I had to uh, leave early, not early as far as normal work day, but for me early because I stayed there 15 hours a day easily. But I left a little early because um, it was my mom's birthday. I wanted to take her out for her birthday, February 8, 2006. So, uh, yeah, like you said, I called her early in the morning, wished her a happy birthday, first thing. Well, it's interesting, and mothers get so proud of their sons, especially when they have a title, that you called from work rather than home because she loved to see the school name pop up on her caller ID. It's like, that's my son, the principal, and he's calling me from school. Yeah, my family's uh, uh, my family, uh, Italian background, 100% Italian, and my ancestors came to this country so that their kids can have uh, the future and the education they never had, you know, the opportunity. So when, when I graduated college, they were so proud, and, and then... Once I became a leader in education, my mom's going to be more proud of me. So I did, you're right, I did like to call from the work phone so she could see my title pop up on her caller ID. As you're at work that day, and again, you walk in this very respected principal, you're going through the day, and you really didn't know what was coming uh, later in the day, but you saw a strange car that was parked outside your building that caught your attention, and it was there basically what most of the day. Yeah, it was there pretty much most of the day. It was... Uh, Plain looking car, nothing uh, that would stand out, but it was a small hamlet uh, where I worked in Hampton Bay. So everybody knew everybody, and everybody knew what everybody drove. I mean, you knew everything about people. So to not recognize a car was rare. So we knew, we didn't know what to think of it, but we knew something that it didn't normally belong uh, where it was. So I just had my security guard, Tom, just watch it. He came up to me, said there's nothing that out of the ordinary that he could see as any threat or problem. I was really more concerned with school safety. Maybe there's somebody you know, lurking amongst the, the students or faculty or who knows. That's what my concern was. So I just made sure my security guard you know, kept abreast of the situation and monitored it. And there was nothing out of the ordinary. So everything seemed okay. You're off to the gym and you dress at the school. You go off, you get in your car, you're ready to take off and you you see this car that's following you. And, and one of the first chapters of the book is called In the Blink of an Eye. And that's so appropriate because Life can change literally in the blink of an eye. Talk about this car because you see it and then you realize these are police that are like rushing your car and arresting you. Yeah, I, 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 on my way, left school, I was around 4, 4, 15, 4 30 in the afternoon by the time I pulled out of the parking lot. Cold winter day, dead of winter, still as can be. And as I'm about to pull on to Main Street and head, head out to, like you said, I was going to get a quick workout in before I picked up my mom. Stopped at the intersection of Main Street in Hampton Bay. It was proud. It's always proud at that intersection. But it seems, I guess, because of the situation I I wound up being in, that there were a thousand people there. I mean, there were crowds of people. At the red light, next thing you know, that same car followed me. And they put put their lights on. And I knew right away there was something wrong. Because usually in that, in Hampton Bay, the South Hampton Town Police, who I knew, and they, they would drive a very noticeable car, and I knew who they were, they knew me. So these people rushed my car, they just got out, all of a sudden, out of nowhere, get out of the car, handcuffed me, next thing you know, I was in custody, just like that, they never spoke to me, they didn't ask anything, they just put handcuffs on me, and and life went from zero to 100 miles an hour in about half a second. And you talk about it, it was almost what a, a mini version of the perp walk, they pulled you out of the car, You've got all these people, and again, probably more than, not as many as you thought as you're looking around, but they all know who you are because you're very prominent in the community. And here you are being shoved around by the cops and in handcuffs. Yeah, they put on a real, I hate to say it, but it was a real dog and pony show. I even asked the officer because there were some young teenagers there and they were crying. I mean, 
with their principal, and I was, they were in tears as, you know, I was in handcuffs. It was a shock to them. And I asked the, the officer, I said, can you at least take me out of their view? Put me in the car so they don't see it. And, you know, they just ignored me and, and paraded me for what seemed like eternity. I'm sure it wasn't eternity, obviously, but, uh, of course, it seemed longer than it was. But it was a pretty good amount of time that they didn't have to do. And I just tried to remain calm and not stare at anybody directly, but not look away in shame. I just... If any, ever you could try to remain calm and confident, I made sure I did that, given the situation. But they did make a real show out of it. And they take you back and they go into questioning, and you're trying to find out what in the world could I possibly have done to end up in, in the result of being arrested in public view and, and taken to the police station. At what point were you able to find out exactly what it is that they were accusing you of? I didn't find out exactly the exact word-for-word description of what I was accused of, believe it or not, until days later. I was arrested on a Wednesday. I didn't find out until, I believe, that Monday afternoon because they didn't tell me while they were interrogating me for seven, seven and a half hours until midnight that same night. From 4.30, I was in custody until midnight. So they interrogated me, never told me what I was arrested for. I spent the night in jail. They took me for arraignment at the centralized for the courthouse. At the courthouse, they told me I was arrested for seven counts of aggravated harassment, and that was it. No details. Just, and I, I'm thinking, what? What was this? Like, can I have to, who? Who filed the complaints? What precisely did I do? What is aggravated harassment? I, I didn't know that at the time. And that that was it. They dragged me away, and I still didn't know what I was accused of. They they gave me uh, they set a bail amount of seventeen thousand five hundred dollars, which obviously I didn't have on me and my parents had to, had to come out with the money. They didn't get the money in time. So try to make a long story short, I wound up spending time in Riverhead jail until my family made bail. So they took me to jail, had the green jumpsuit on and everything. And I'm, I'm thinking to myself, what has just happened to my life? And what did I do? Why am I here? It wasn't until I got bailed out. And then after the weekend, I went to see my attorney when he gave me the statements, they asked me to go home and read them. And when I went home and read them, that's, that's precisely when I, when I learned who filed the complaint and what I was accused of. You're listening to This Week in America. Our guest on the program is Frank Vetro. The book is called Standing on Principle. The book is available at Amazon, Barnes & Noble, information at our website. You can link on directly to Frank's website by going to thisweekinamerica.us. Frank's website is frankvetro.com. It's very simple, F-R-A-N-K, and Vetro is V-E-T-R-O dot com. And it's sort of a side issue, but it's like I thought we were beyond this. As you're in and you, you meet your attorneys, the first thing one of the attorney asks is, is your father connected to the mafia? I mean, at this point, what, what's your mind like at this point? It's like, what does that have to do with anything? I can't believe you're asking me that. My life is at stake. You're asking me if my father was connected with the mafia. Yeah, he actually, true story, he did ask that. It was, the actual attorney that represented me did not, but I guess his partner or the owner the, the owner of the firm, he actually, sitting to the left of me, did ask that. And I'm thinking, just what you just said, what the heck? What does that mean? I mean, are you going to treat me differently? Are you going to cut the price, you know, for me? <laughs> What's the point? See, right? But he did ask that, and I answered, of course, no course not so now what you know what let's get back to me now and right? you did and you you get these complaints and you read through these and talk about that because these are people that you knew but you had no idea it had gotten out of hand it got ever got to this point yeah i knew uh, most of the people i knew i knew three of them very very close uh before i went to hanton bays i was a science teacher at newfield high school and I was a single guy, and I had relationships with a few women in Newfield while I was at Newfield High School. And that's one of the reason, reasons why I left Newfield High School, because when I got my, my administrative degree and my school district leadership uh, diploma, I realized that I probably made a few mistakes where I was working um, with the relationships I was having with consensual adults. I wasn't their boss. We were, we were colleagues. We were all teachers. And I figured it would be tough for me to be the boss where I am now after having these relationships. So I moved on. And I thought everybody else moved on, too. One person stayed pretty close to me, a social studies teacher. She stayed real close to me, and she was a good friend to me, so I thought. 
turns out that she was the person that kind of augmented a conspiracy against me. And she got a lot of these women to file complaints that I didn't even know what was going on. I, they filed complaints against me that about making phone calls to them. And, and, I, and I have to tell you, just to get it out, out of the way, I did call these women on occasion, and they called me too. And we said some, I, I, I don't mind saying, we said some sexual things to each other as consensual adults, but not what they claimed I said, uh, and not what they, they claimed happened ha about me harassing them on the phone. That never happened. It wasn't me, if it even happened at all, whoever did it. I know it wasn't me, and they never said I did it. That's the funny thing. But it was somehow linked to me through Michelle, the social studies teacher. And when I saw Michelle's name on that complaint, let me tell you something, uh, my heart dropped. I, I was in shock because she was, I thought, such a good friend to me. You know, it's interesting as, as you're reading through that, this was not a situation where an accusation was made. They came, talked to you, and investigated. It went from right the, the accusation to you're arrested. I mean, the first time you've had a chance to even sort this out is when you've been arrested and, and arraigned. Exactly. The police officer never spoke to me, never asked me anything, never got my side of the story, nothing. No questions asked. They just believed the social studies teacher, Michelle Koenig. Uh, I'm sorry, I don't know if I'm allowed to mention names here, but... Um, they just went on her story and that was it. That was it. Never got the other side of the story. And next thing you know, I'm in Tufts and my, my life spirals down. And I'm labeled a terrorist. Literally, the police commissioner, Richard Dorman, went on the evening news and essentially called me a terrorist. A terrorist. I mean, I was beside, I'm still, you know, when I, even when I hear myself say that now, I'm beside myself. All because of an accusation that wasn't even true. And there were so many ramifications, and you talk about that in the book. You're trying to sort of sort this out, and maybe it's not quite as bad as I think it's going to be, and I'm going to talk to my, my cohorts at school, I'm going to talk to my family, and I will explain. And you pick up a paper, and, and you see the coverage, and here is the police commissioner, as you say, basically calling you a terrorist. I mean, you are labeled a really bad guy. What are you thinking about it? Were you able to digest all of this, or is this still almost an out-of-body experience at, at this point? No, it was it was surreal. Uh, my world, I'm not going to lie to you, it was spinning. I mean, when I saw the news and, and all the news clippings that my, my family saved for me, I asked them to save it. And then when I saw the the news on uh, the television media, what, what they were saying, I, I, I was beside, I couldn't believe it. And I only hoped that, you know, the students and the, the, the people I work with and people that I really knew could see through it all and see that, you know, just hold off and, and let me get my side of the story out there first because what was being said over what amounted to, Rick, it, what, it was basically what amounted to a prank phone call. So silly, not to downplay it, but I didn't even do it. And when it all said and done, it was a prank phone call that I was alleged to have made. And they called me a terrorist. I mean, you have to be careful to call a terrorist a terrorist these days after the 9-11 incident. There's federal statutes. And here I am on the news of terrorists. It was, it was, it really was surreal. I couldn't put my head around it. Frank Vetro, our guest on This Week in America. The book is called Standing on Principle. It's available at Barnes & Noble, at Amazon. Information, and you can link on directly to that at our website, thisweekinamerica.us. Frank's website is frankvetro.com, V-E-T-R-O. The time going by way too quickly before we talk about where this sort of ended and we'll have you back to go into detail because there's so many things here that people don't understand about the uh, law enforcement, the judicial system. You find out who your friends are, right? In a situation like this, talk about, uh, and you got both reactions. You had friends, family, uh, parents, students that actually raised money for you to help for your legal defense and, and help pay the bail. That's true. At, when it first happened, uh, my friend, got bail money up for me and paid the entire bail. And the people in the Hampton Bay's community did raise some money to help offset some of the costs of the attorney's fees. So um, throughout the onset of the case, at least, um, there was a pretty tremendous amount of support for me still in Hampton Bay. Unfortunately, I did lose some friends at the onset of the uh, criminal action. You find out who your friends are real quick, but um, there was a second wave, as you know, 
of bad news coming my way. So just when I thought I hit rock bottom, something else happened. And when that happened, pretty much just about the rest of the world ran for the hills too. And I was left on my own, unfortunately. Well, and you talk about during this whole period, you just wanted to be able to talk to somebody and tell your story. And people from the outside looking in go, but geez, you, you got the truth on your side. If you didn't do it, you just sit and you explain that. It's really not that easy, is it? No. They don't let you tell your side of the story. The, when, you, when you're caught up in the court system, and no disrespect to any attorneys or prosecutors or judges, you know, there's good people working in the system, but the system is terribly, terribly broken. And when you're in front, you know, when you go in front of a judge, they don't speak with you. They speak to your judge, even though you, I'm sorry, they speak to your attorney, right. even though you're standing right next to them and you're just known as a defendant or a docket number. And they talk about you as if you're not even there and you never get your say and never once, you know, it's now 2014, almost 2015, and never once between my criminal cases and my civil suits have I spoken to a judge yet. It's about what? going on nine years now, and I still have never said my side of the story to a judge in person yet. You don't get to say your side. They don't talk to you. And it's, it's absurd the way they delay in the paperwork. And then they tell you not to talk about it publicly and put unofficial gag orders on you. You don't get your side of the story out there. They don't let you. The book is called Standing on Principle. It's available at Amazon, Barnes & Noble, Frank's website, frankvetro.com. Uh, rapidly running out of time. Let's talk about how the criminal case ended. Talk about the the end result of that. Then we'll mention what you're doing now and we'll have you back on the program because there's so many interesting and important aspects that we that we really need to talk about. How did this case work itself through? Okay, so what happened was I fought tooth and nail to go to trial and I was trying so hard, but what happened was I was unemployed. I was discharged from my job, uh, ultimately, from Hampton Bay. And I was unemployed, and the stigma of being unemployed, uh, of being uh, arrested so publicly, as a high school principal, I couldn't get a job anywhere, never mind in education, but doing anything, period. So I went unemployed for almost four years. I was unemployed. I had no more money left. I was forced from my home. I was in my car, Rick, in my car, and ran out of money. So my attorneys kind of, you know, if you don't have money, it's justice to the highest bidder in the United States of America. Exactly, yes. So when you don't have any money, they don't do any work for you. So they kind of, they pretty much bailed out on me and I had nothing left and I fought. And even when I had nothing left, I was in my car, I still pushed for trial and they kept delaying and they kept adjourning and they knew I was unemployed. They knew I had nothing left. So ultimately they, they said, listen, here's the disposition. You could plead the two violations. I had eight crimes against me, Rick. They said, plead the two violations, have a completely clean fingerprint record. We're going to steal the case and you go back to where you weren't, you know, beforehand. In Hampton Bay, in Hampton Bay, um, my superintendent and I and the Board of Ed had an agreement where I would be, go back to my employment. So even though I fought tooth and nail, I already at that point lost hundreds of thousands of dollars. I had nothing left, wasn't living at home anymore, had nothing. I said, let me just cut my losses and I'll take the deal, I'll go back to work, even though I didn't want to. So that day was sadder than the day I was actually arrested because I did not want to do it. I almost cried in court. So after it happened, Hampton Bay's reneged. They didn't take me back. And I said, wait a second, what's going on? And that is when I start to uncover what I say is the biggest cover-up in Long Island. I can't believe what I uncovered after that. So while living in my car, I kind of, the world turned its back on me. I was on my own. You know, I couldn't get a job as a paper boy, okay? I still have the application for it to be a paper boy, Rick, and I couldn't get hired to do that. So I went to see a priest that I knew, Father Frank, um, who does a lot of good on Long Island, probably the most popular priest on Long Island. And I knew him from when I was an educator, a public school educator, and I just wanted to talk to him. And he told me in not so many words, I'll, I'll keep his opinion, I'll respect his opinion, and I, keep, I won't share his exact words, but he thought I deserved better. He could not believe what happened to me. So he offered me a position at his school, which I didn't even know he had. So I'm currently now, uh, I'm an educator at, at his school, where we help actually work with the public school districts on Long Island and family and criminal courts on Long Island. So actually, actually I work with the two entities that took my life away. That's the irony of this whole thing. And what I do is I educate the kids that have been arrested, kicked out of school, in and out of facilities, really behind the eight wall. You know, they, they come from not so good a background. 
and they need a break and a second chance. So what I do is I help educate them, and we kind of rehab them and put them back into their community, into their public school as productive citizens. So, you know, it, it, it's kind of uh, an irony, but it, it's a great job. It, it, it's uh, very beneficial to us, their community, and them. Our guest on the program, Frank Vetro. The book is called Standing on Principle. We are out of time, but we will have Frank back because it is so important to to understand. And you make a case and, and, and you say it's a legal system, not a justice system. To many people, that would be a shock. And the politics that enters into this, it's really not black and white guilt and innocence. There are so many gray areas that work in, uh, in sort of unison against the, the accused in this case. Frank, we would love to have you back on the program. It's an excellent book. It's a shocking book, Standing on Principle. I know you really didn't want to write this book, but you really felt that some good could come out of that. And I know you're getting some very positive feedback on the book as well. I'm getting amazing. Better than I thought I'd get. I can't believe the feedback I'm getting. Emails from people that don't even know me. They contact me. They're so grateful. They may have experienced something very similar. Or just people in general that that have read the book and have a different perspective on life after reading the book, you know. I, I can't believe the reviews I'm getting. Like you said, I didn't plan on writing it. I just wanted to, hopefully, that my, my tragedy could help others and create some type of change and, and prevent future injustice. That was my goal. Well, it's an important book. It's called Standing on Principle. Again, it's available at Amazon, Barnes & Noble, information at our website, thisweekinamerica.us. Frank Vetro, our guest on the program. Thank uh, Frank, thank you so much for coming on the program, sharing your story with us. We look forward to having you back on the show. I also look forward to it. Thank you so much, Rick. Really appreciate it. You're welcome. You're listening to This Week in America, website thisweekinamerica.us.